Okay, so I think I may wait 10 seconds. Sometimes I've seen people have a hard time like connecting, but we'll do 10, 9, so count down and then. Okay, friends, hello, hello. I am your host, Ali Mohebi. And on behalf of my co hosts, Lindsay Cameron, Rebecca Evans, and Ben Engelhardt, I would like to welcome you to our special VIDA lecture, a conversation with Lord and Frank about the structure of scientific talks. So, this lecture is a precursor to our one day symposium, The Future of Dopamine. On November 19th, we will get together to hear from 18 postdoc scholars summarizing years of their efforts of, uh, to investigate dopamine structure and function. They are the future of dopamine. And if you haven't already signed up for this symposium, please do so and we will be in touch. A full program for our event is now available on our website, videoconference.com. And I believe Lindsay would post it on the chat. With that, it is my pleasure, privilege, and honor to introduce our guest today. Um, it'll be a very long list if I try to go through his CV, I'll summarize. And uh, Lauren is an HHMI investigator, a professor of physiology at UCSF, director of Cavill Institute for Fundamental Neuroscience, and other things. He's an amazing scientist, a very kind colleague, and a supportive mentor to many of us. And he's also an awesome science speaker. So uh, we asked him to share some of his tips and tricks for how to give a talk. The structure of this, I think he will go for like 40, 50, or up to an hour. And then he asked, if you have questions, you can post them uh, in the ask a question button. And then some of us will pick it up and we may interrupt him with questions or we can save him for the end of his lecture. So you can use chat for just chatting purposes and post your questions in the ask a question section. And without further ado, Lauren Frank. All right, go. thank you, Holly. I will share my screen now, which uh, yes. Ollie and others know means that I won't see anything else. So please do, you know, verbally interrupt if you need me to do something. Uh, so here we go. Uh, so it's all right. So um, let me. I should just ask Ollie. Can you confirm that you can all see this? Yes, I can see that okay. nice and clear. Okay, Thank fair you. enough. So uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. I I feel like oral presentations are a really critical thing that we all do, and something I've certainly spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and so you know, when I originally did this, actually, this is a second version of a presentation I did uh, for our local UCSF group, and I started it with this title of how to give a talk. And the challenge here is if you ask any two scientists how to give a talk, they will not most likely give you the same answer, uh, which is a bit problematic. And so you get to this point of, well, how do we, how do, we do gradient ascent in talk quality space? Um, and so what I think is perhaps a better way to do this is to say, what I'm gonna do is tell you one way to give a talk. This is, I think, um, an effective way. One of the challenges, as we'll talk about later, is how do you know if you're doing a good job? Um, and you can sort of listen to how much positive feedback you get, but we all know that feedback is highly biased to be positive. Uh, so that's another challenge and that's something I'll also talk about. Um, but we can also just change this then to something that I think is accurate, which is how to give a talk that Lauren likes. Uh, from my perspective, if more of the talks in the world were talks that I really enjoy, the world would be a better place. And I think, although I cannot prove that my enjoyment of a talk is strongly correlated enough with other people's enjoyments of the talk, that this hopefully will actually be useful for all of you. Um, but I wanna just mention, of course, that there's subjectivity here. That said, I really also wanna put this back on as objective a framework as we can, You know, given that many of you are interested in dopamine and things like that, we can ask, well, why are we doing this? And actually, you know, perhaps why would dopamine be relevant? Before we get to that point, I just wanna say, um, another thing I did for this Kavli talk was that I wrote up about five pages of notes on what my thoughts on what are important elements of a talk, how to practice, how to think about it. This website, which I guess you could all screen capture or you can email me or maybe Ali about, this resources has a number of things, including a video of my previous talk, 
a link where if you click on it, you'll download those five pages of notes as well as stuff like advice to young faculty and so on. So just wanted to encourage people to feel free to check out our resources page if they're interested in more. Okay, so let's start with this question of why are we here? Or why are any of you interested in this? Why do we bother giving talks? All right, and now this is obvious, right? We are trying to communicate our science to people within and outside our field. Um, this often involves providing a synthesis of multiple findings. So, you know, you might, you might talk about a single paper, but you often will talk about a whole research program or a set of program, a set of papers that, you know, you've contributed to, that you've been part of. And this is actually incredibly important because this is one way that you advance your career, right? Whether it be a public talk where people get to know you, a job talk, right? For those of you who are postdocs, this is, your job talk really matters. It really matters that you do a good job explaining why what you're doing is important, demonstrating that you've thought well about it, and so on and so forth. But at a more fundamental level, the reason we give talks, or what we're trying to accomplish with our talks, is really the induction of neuroplasticity in our audience. Um, probably dopaminergically dependent neuroplasticity, but of course that is speculative at this point, remains to be determined. But I just want to talk about this for a moment. All right, so like, let's talk about what I'm doing right now. Imagine that an hour from now, 45 minutes from now, you come away with this and you don't remember anything that I said. All right, well, maybe then this was a useful meditative experience that took you away from the election trauma that many of us have been experiencing and the other COVID trauma and the other challenges of our current day-to-day -day life. But from a talk perspective and a science perspective and a learning things perspective, this will have been a complete waste of your time. Right? Your goal as a speaker is not to waste people's times. You, in fact, want them to remember what you did. You want to change their brains. And so you want to change their brains in a way that is positive, that moves the field forward, that moves your career forward, that helps. And so what I want to point out is that you can use all of the knowledge that you've gained about how the brain works, how attention works, how learning works, to help you think about the kinds of structures that you want to give. Um, the other thing that's really important here is that talks are storytelling. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I don't mean that we're making stuff up, right? You never, ever make stuff up. You, or if you do, you label it really clearly. Hey, I'm just hypothesizing here. But you're telling a scientific story. So it's a true story, but stories can be more or less effective. And so we want to talk about what makes a story, in this sense, more effective. All right, so what's required for this kind of successful talk? Um, and as Ollie sort of indicated, what I'll do is I have different sections, so I'll pause for a moment at the end of each section and just, um, you know, if anyone wants to type things into the chat that anyone that can then be read to me, I'm happy to stop. All right, so what do we need to do if we wanna be successful? So during the talk, right, the audience needs to understand, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but the audience is coming from where they are, right? What's already in their brains, what kind of mental structures they have. They need to be able to use what they know to accurately interpret what you're telling them. So you need to take them from where they are to where you want them to be. You are not taking them from where you are to where you want them to be because they don't know as much as you do about your topic, typically speaking. Right? So it's incredibly important to realize that you're trying to make them understand, which means you need to start from where they start, not from where you start. So among this specifically, why should they care? And this is perhaps the most fundamentally important thing. And this is something actually that is not done as well as I wish it does, was in most talks. So why does this matter? Why did you spend years of your life on this problem? right? Are you happy that you did so? If you're happy that you spent years of your life on this problem, you need to tell them why. Why was this worth it? So why is the question that's being addressed important? Why would answering this question move the field forward, move towards something that really would change things? Okay, and now getting back to that other point, what's the starting point for the work? What is known, or really accurately, what was known at the time you started doing this work? So what's the context that makes this work you know, sort of useful and so on and so forth. Um, if you don't know the context and people just tell you what they found, you may not know enough to know why what they found is a step forward, right? So your job as a speaker is to always start from, here's what we know, here's our thoughts about how things work. And I'll give you some examples of this from a couple of different talks. 
Then, and this is critical, right? This is critical for talks. This is critical for papers, any kind of presentation. What is the gap? What is the thing that you're going to answer? The question that you're going to answer that was not answered. So what was not known when you started this? And again, why is that an important thing? Then you have what follows from the gap, which are the questions you are addressing. So what exactly are you going to tell them about? What, what problems are you going to solve? And then the rest of the talk, all right? And so I'm putting this all here. I'll talk a little bit more about it in detail. But once you set things up, the hope is that the rest just flows nicely, right? Because then you have this, you've already established the gap and the questions you're addressing. And so then everything else should be a direct answer to those questions. It should directly address the gap that you found and it should directly say, okay, here's the question number one, here's what I did, here's how I answered that question. And I just wanna say, if you think about this, what we're doing again is we're constructing mental structures in our the heads of our audience. And it, the best way to construct those structures or a effective, an effective way to construct those structures is to have a structure, a scaffolding that helps you understand all of this. And that's really what this is about, is establishing the sort of foundation for the scaffolding and then the scaffolding on top of it. Okay, finally, after you've done all this, you wanna synthesize your results, right? What does it all mean? What are your hypotheses? What, is your, what are your next steps? What are you interested in? This could be you know, different in different talks and in job talks, the synthesis might lead into five or 10 minutes of what you're going to do. Um, in a regular talk, it might just be, oh, we've understood these things and now we have some new questions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now that's what you need to do. What does the audience need to do? All right, well, again, we're trying to create plasticity. We're trying to drive dynamics in people's brains. So how, what are the characteristics we know of? Well, we know that if the audience is asleep, the odds are that the vast majority of the sensory input they're being, that's going in is getting filtered out at least by the thalamus, right? So we don't think that that's gonna be successful. So they need to be awake, right? They should be engaged, they should care. They should be ideally having a good time. That's hard to arrange. Um, I will point out on the awake thing, you know, if you ever give a talk at an undergraduate institution and, um, this is obviously in the in the sort of COVID times where we're doing all of this through Zoom or Crowdcast or whatever it is. This is much harder to tell. But if you ever do give a talk to a place where they're undergrads, it seems like there's always at least a few undergrads who come to a talk to take a nap. So don't take it too personally if a couple of them are snoozing. But you want the majority of your audience to be awake and you want them to be listening to what you're saying, not checking their phones, uh, not you know thinking about what they're going to do next. You want them to be engaged. You'd like them to be impressed, right? Ideally, you'd like them to say, wow, that was really cool. You know, she did a fantastic job of laying out that science and what it means. And wow, I wish she were my colleague, right? That's the kind of thing you really want to come out of this sort of thing. You want them to be convinced. So you want them to be very clear about what have you learned. I also think it's equally clear to be clear, equally important to be clear about what the limitations are or the next steps. It doesn't mean you need to sort of, you know, cut the uh, sort of foundation out from under themselves, but you need to be honest, right? What do you know? What do you not know? And I'll just say, you know, as someone who's on search committees and things, one of the things we really look for are people who know what they know and know what they don't know and can talk about it. And so that's really useful. Okay. Um, I think I'll, I'll do a brief pause there. Any, I'll just go back to this. Any quick questions so far? Hopefully this is kind of obvious, but maybe not. We can move on. I think. I don't okay, great. Thank you, Ali. That's very really helpful. Okay. And then finally, when we get to the end of this, the audience needs to remember, right? You want to have created long lasting memories in them. You want to have induced synaptic potentiation throughout the hippocampus, neocortex, and possibly in other places. We're still working all that out so that they remember what you said. So that when they think about whatever it is that you work on, dopamine, I guess, for many of you, that they remember your contribution. All right, so you wanna do that because in fact, you want to change the way they think and act, right? That's the point of a talk is to, that's why we go to talks is to learn things that might then you know, have some influence on the way we're thinking, on our conceptual processes, on who we hire, on the experiments we do, that sort of thing. Okay, so if we think about this in specifically, 
your talk, you might say it could inspire them to, first of all, if they're outside your field, think your field is interesting. This is really important. Um, and again, this depends on the venue, right? For those people giving dopamine talks, you probably don't need to convince everyone that dopamine is interesting at a dopamine focused conference, right? I think you've got that more or less. But for outsiders who are coming to this conference who might not know, you really should tell them why they should care. So you want them to think your field is interesting and moving places. You might want them to follow your work, right? Oh, that person really does high quality stuff. I want to read their papers when they come out. Um, this is really hard these days. As we all know, it's incredibly difficult to keep up with the literature. And what some people do is they search for particular individuals who they think do good work. You might want them to hire you. Now, this can happen at any stage. This can happen as a graduate student when you're giving a talk as a, as a postdoc interview. This can happen as a postdoc giving a talk, a job talk, and this can even happen as a professor where you might want to move institutions. Um, or, you know, if you decide to go into biotech, you go to a company, you want them to hire you, you're presenting what you did. So that really matters to convince them of all of these things. Um, you might also, like if you're a professor and you're, or, you know, you're running a lab somewhere or something like this, you want to inspire people to want to work with you. So you want to tell them, hey, this work matters, this is really important, and you could be part of it, right? That's exciting. And or, you know, alternately, you might want them to want to collaborate with you. Like, oh, wow, that person is doing really insightful work. I really wish I had that expertise, and it would be great if we could work together. So it's really helpful. I and mean, you know, the goal here is not, you're not manipulating the audience, right? You're just trying to do a good job of explaining things, teaching them things in a way that leaves a positive impression. Okay. Laura, if right. I may interject, I have a question. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Okay, well, I'll just finish this one point, Ollie, and then, and then lastly, right, um, sometimes you give talks to foundations. Sometimes you give talks to people with um, money, and that might be, there might be talks that happen to have study section members in it, it might be others. And so you want to have people want to support your work more generally. Okay, sorry, Ali, Ali, go ahead. So, no, this is a question from Priscilla Ambrosi. She's asking, I think relating to the previous slide, that do you have any unexpected strategy to keep people awake at net inducing hours? Okay, sorry, you broke up a little bit. What I heard, and that might be my, my fault, what I heard is a strategy for pe keeping people awake. Right. Especially yes. at uh, weird hours, right after <laughs> Yeah, weird hours is tough. And it really helps if you're actually in a talk in a room with people where you can have coffee, um, right? And, and, you know, Zoom is really, or the Zoom video conferences are really hard for this too, right? Because maintaining people's attention, staring at a screen where you can't make eye contact and so on, again, it's all really tough. So I'll talk more about this later, but I think you want to make it as easy as possible for people to follow what you're doing. Because as soon as you get lost, you're done, right? And so imagine like, so, you know, I only speak English and maybe a tiny bit of French. So let me, let's imagine I go to a room and the speaker is speaking in German, right? Or some other language, it doesn't matter which one. Um, I might follow the pretty pictures for a little while, but I'm gonna have no clue as what's going on. Right? And so I think one of the most important things is this level of, you know, making sure that they understand and that they're engaged. Um, it's great if you can be funny occasionally. That's hard to do. It's hard to force. But, you know, sometimes that can be nice. Um, and then also, I would just say being excited. Like if you love your work, if you're really excited about what you do, it's great to let that show. It's great to show how passionate you are because that's, um, you know, that's infectious. So if you really like what you do, you know, be animated, go up there and say, wow, you know, we were so excited when we figured this out. We, we thought this was really, you know, or when I saw these results, it really changed the way I thought. And that was really exciting for me. Things like that can really help. Um, and, but I'll, and I'll talk more about, you know, other things I think, again, if, if people are really there and with you um, because they think the work is interesting, that really helps keep them awake. All right, Ali, any other questions or anyone else? Let's move on, yeah. Okay, great. How about you again? All right, sounds good. Um, so, 
Okay, so now let's let's talk a little bit more about the neuroscience of all of this, all right? And as many of you, or some of you may know, my lab studies learning and memory and how the brain creates memories of things and uh, makes decisions and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, we actually know a fair amount about what's required to learn and remember complex information, at least at the conceptual level, sort of, which is useful for thinking about talks. Okay, so again, if you want to learn something, you have to start with what you know, all right? You can't just jump off into some new field, right? So imagine, you know, this is perhaps most clear with mathematics. So if you try and learn new math that uses a bunch of symbols and things that you do not understand, it is hopeless, right? There's just no way to bridge that gap. So in all cases, you have to start with what's already known. And again, here you have to start with what's known in your audience, not in you. And this is really, really hard right? Because you are such an expert in what you do, it's often hard to step out of that and ask, well, what do these people know? We'll come back to that a little bit, but that's, that's a critical first point. Second, organization, right? So, you know, there's lots of studies just on memory, right? So you probably, many of you know that there are mnemonic techniques where, for example, if you want to remember a long list of things, you can imagine walking through your house and associating each thing with a place in that. And the idea here, and this is just the sort of general conceptual framework for this, is that you are providing a mental scaffold because you want to provide retrieval cues. So you don't want things to live on their own, unconnected to the rest of the sort of knowledge networks in your brain. You want them tightly integrated, or in your audience's brain, of course. You want these things tightly integrated with their existing framework. Um, and what you're building is things, a set of relationships of stuff that goes together, right? What happens um, in this particular part of the brain at this particular time and what does that mean and these are all interrelationships that you're trying to get them to remember so this conceptual scaffolding of how it all fits together is really critical um, and I, I just want to say just think about a story right if you imagine a story where every paragraph is about something completely different right you can't follow that you know maybe at the end of it it wraps it all up but i personally get really frustrated by books like that because it's like ah i don't want to work that hard i work hard enough at my normal job so with the, when the information is hard as it always is in scientific talks you want to make it as easy as possible for people to build the pieces in their brains and connect them together Okay, and again, that's this next point, clear connections. You want all of the connections, you want every slide to follow from the previous slide in a clear and obvious way. And if you're changing course, you want a clear signpost that says, okay, we did that, now we're moving on to this. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then finally, you've got to maintain attention. And this was related to the question earlier about sleep. You really want people to be awake. You want them also to be focusing on what you want them to focus on. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too. And then finally, this is something that is perhaps not as obvious, but you know, think about, well, hopefully none of you are taking tests anymore. I hope for your sake, you're not taking tests, but remember back to high school and college when you had to take a test. Um, what did you do to learn the material? Well, you practiced, you repeated it, right? You know, what is the capital of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This repetition is actually really important for creating memories. Um, you know, and as many of you know, one of the hypotheses about why the hippocampus is critical for forming memories for the events of daily life is that it repeats during offline periods, these experiences to the rest of the brain. So you as a speaker and as a storyteller can do the same thing. You can bring up your scaffolding and then you can repeat it and you can show these things multiple times and that really helps hammer in these concepts um, and it you know you obviously you don't want to repeat them over and over again but it's surprising how much you can get away with as you build this up and how much more effective it is as far as i can tell in terms of getting people to remember okay a few other things to consider before we start talking about the details this is critical who are you talking to all right so again, you always start with what your audience knows. And I guess I'll, I'll just talk about this a little bit. If you ever go give a talk to a donor, for example, who's not a scientist, oh my goodness, do you not want to give them your normal talk? That would be a disaster because they'll have no idea what you're talking about because they don't have the starting point. Um, conversely, if you're giving a talk to a bunch of senior faculty, they probably know a lot and they can probably follow things at a quite high rate, right? So different audiences require different targets. Mixed audiences are hard, 
But, you know, think about like a, a group of second graders at your local school. Boy, do you want to do that differently than graduate students and graduate students you might want to do differently from sort of senior people in your field. And again, you just have to step back and say, okay, what do they know? So what did I know back then when I was that way? Or if I find someone from this group, what do they know now? And can I use that then? Or can I intuit then where I need to start in sort of building up my picture? Okay, how long is the talk? This is really important, um, especially early in your career. And for some people throughout their career, there's this goal of packing everything in because you want to impress people and show them how much you've done. And the result is that no one follows anything and they don't remember a damn thing. So don't do that, all right? I know it's tempting, I know it's hard not to. Um, deleting slides is painful, right? Oh, that's so important, I've gotta tell them about that. Don't do it. So you cannot mm -hmm. compress a 50 minute talk into a 10 or 30 minute talk without removing content. It just, I've never seen it done, let me rephrase that. You have to take things out. All right, and so you have to think, and I have more detail on this in some of the notes about what are the key things, right? What do I need to show people? What is the critical aspect of this that I need to show? And you know, maybe in my 10 minute talk, I leave out the controls or I just put a little note, we controlled for X and I don't show it. But in the 50 minute talk, maybe I show those controls. So really think about this. Um, and for me, when I give a talk, one slide a minute is a reasonable rule of thumb, although I'm actually often below that. So look at what, you're, what you've done, see how long it takes to explain it. And as I'll be telling you, it probably takes longer to explain things than you think it does. So keep this in mind. All right. And then finally, how formal is the talk, right? Who are you talking to? Now, one thing that I was told, I don't remember who told me this, I think as a graduate student, is that there's no such thing as an informal talk. It's not quite true. Lab meetings, for example, right? You can be kind of sloppier. You're just throwing up some slides. That's fine. But in general, anytime you're giving a talk outside your lab or to a group, you know, you want people to look at it and remember it positively. Um, and depending on how who those people are and how much you want to impress them, you may want to spend different amounts of time or how much you want to change their brains. You want to spend different amounts of time sort of really, really sort of honing your talk and making it as good as you can. Okay, so that's another place where I can pause for a moment. Any... Yes, actually, I have a question for you. From, this okay. is from Amir Hussein Daroi, and he's asking, should this repetition that you mentioned have a specific pattern? I mean, should your second repetition for the audience be different from the first one, third one? I mean, would you yep. rephrase or would you just repeat yourself? Great question. So in general, um, you don't, yeah, it's, it's a really important point, and I think this will become clearer as I lay out what's coming next. But the short answer is, obviously, repeating the same phrase over and over again can be a little boring. But if something is complicated, then repeating it is not necessarily a bad idea. You can say, so, you know, remember a couple of slides back where we found out that, you know, these particular neurons project to here. Right? So what you're doing is reminding of them of something, creating basically a memory consolidation event in their brains. Um, and so it's that, it's pulling them back to stuff you did before, but I don't think there's a specific answer about whether, you know, usually I would tend to do it in a different, different phrasing. Um, I tend not to write out my talks in part because I've been doing this a while and so I've sort of figured out how to speak consistently without having them written out. Um, sometimes people need to do that when they start. But I would tend not to not to do anything that seems artificial, right? So if you say, okay, so we learned this, and then you come back later and say, and we learned this, you say exactly the same thing, that's probably not optimal. But if you're reminding of them, them of it for a reason, then you can get away with saying almost exactly the same thing. Um, and that I realized was not a very specific answer, but let me come back to what I mean by repetition. And then if you have a, if you have a further question, let me know. All right, anything? Wait, let's move on. Okay, okay, so, Talk elements, right? You all know this, basically. Um, introduction, and I'll just, that one's clear, right? What's the starting point? Second, what are the questions? What are you trying to figure out? You know, <clears throat> why and why are those questions important? So I, I think it's really helpful to pose questions or to, you know, ask, ask a question, because that's what we're trying to do as scientists is answer these questions. Then we have sort of the methods, results, and discussion, which I'll talk a little bit, but not as much about, because that's sort of uh, more specific to specific fields. 
and then synthesis. All right, and so now let's go through each of these elements in turn to see where we get to. So let's start with the introduction. So what I've done here is I've borrowed slides from a colleague of mine, David Morgan. Now, David Morgan is a yeast biologist, all right, who studies cell division. And he is nonetheless able to give, un or he does give beautiful talks that everyone can understand. He's amazing. And so I borrowed his slides because I think they illustrate where you want to start, okay? And so here is his introductory slide for a biology audience, which is, you know, and I will try and do what he does, but I can't do it as well as he does. So please don't, don't you know, forgive me for that. So he points out that cell regulation depends on the control of macromolecular interactions. So I, I hope you can see my um, pointer here, actually here, let me turn that into something a little bit more visible. So in cells, and what's going on all the time is you have two different proteins and they either bind together or they are separated. And in fact, that this is the fundamental thing that seems to control everything in a cell in some way. And so when they come together, you often get an output signal that then regulates subsequent processes. And you often have regulators that determine when they come together or not, all right? And this is a fundamental process. And if we can understand this fundamental process of how these molecules come together, how they're regulated, how they signal, then we understand a huge amount of cell biology. So I'll just pause for a moment and say, what I love about that is anyone, hopefully with a little bit of background in biology can understand it, right? It's simple, it's straightforward. It says, this is a fundamental problem. So you start out with this big wide fundamental problem. Then what David does is go into the specific thing that he does, which is studying chromosome duplication. And you know, again, this is sort of a cartoon picture of how chromosomes are duplicated, how they're laid out on the mitotic spindles and how those are pulled apart and so on. And then he says, you know, this process of course is governed by those same rules of things coming together or not. And specifically the one that we've been studying is anaphase promoting complex, which comes in a set of things that come to and bind together and cause the, these mitotic spindles to pull the chromosomes apart. And so just again, to step back about that, so what, what is really nice about the way he does this is it's, okay, here's a fundamental thing in biology and here's a specific implementation of it that maybe we can get a handle on, right? And I think, I think that really means that you're, you're along with him. You know, even though we've gotten very specific here very quickly, you can follow, you know why that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting because it's controlling stuff, molecules coming together. All right, so I hope that's clear. Let me do it now. This is what I tend to do when I start my talks is I sort of start about, well, okay, what we often study in my lab is memory. And so I start with this video, which was actually um, grabbed by my postdoc Gideon Rothschild. So this is, for those of you who don't recognize it, a movie from the video, movie Ratatouille. And here is the food critic tasting the red restaurant's Ratatouille. And it drives this amazing time travel back to his past where he remembers coming in from outdoors, he remembers his mother feeding him, taking care of him, he remembers the way he feels. And this entire experience comes back to him in a flash. Okay, so the reason I do this is that this is something that everyone in the audience should be able to relate to, right? It's really just, it's something everyone has had some experience of at least a little bit. We know that our memories are fundamental to our daily lives. Uh, Subsequently in the movie, this experience alters the person's behavior, the food critic's behavior, so I can talk about that. So again, I'm starting with something that everybody can relate to. And then I can say, okay, now what do we know about that process? And so I say, well, let me tell you the high level view of how we think that works, what we know and what we don't know. And briefly, I'll just go through this again in the same idea. So how would you create a memory? Um, and I might even say something like, again, what I said to you all before, I'm hoping you'll create a memory of this talk. How would that work? Well, you're seeing me and you're hearing me and smelling your coffee or whatever it is. And as you all know, that information is processed in many stages of the brain's hierarchy, including through a set of cortical areas that seem to be specialized for extracting out features of experience. Um, we think, as far as we can tell, that creating memories involves synaptic plasticity. And while these areas are plastic, that plasticity seems to be relatively slow. As a result, it seems that if you only have these cortical areas, you can't form memories for the events of daily life. That is things that only happen once. 
those things where you need really rapid plasticity. Fortunately, there is this process we often refer to as encoding, where the information is sent to the hippocampus, which then feeds back to the cortex. The hippocampus is a site of very rapid plasticity. Synapses there can change extremely quickly. And something quite magical happens where this information is fed in through many stages, processed somehow, driving synaptic plasticity in the hippocampus, and likely back to these areas that allows these memories to be encoded as they happen. Interestingly, this same loop is thought to be involved in memory retrieval. So that if I say something like, think about that movie from Ratatouille, or that, that scene from Ratatouille, information will come into your auditory cortex that might help trigger the hippocampus to reactivate patterns distributed throughout the brain about what things look like and sound like and so on. Okay, that's the short version of it. But I just want to unpack what the goal was there, right? Everybody should be able to follow this. Now, every, you know, obviously this assumes a neuroscience background, but even without a neuroscience background, the goal is to define things clearly enough that you can say, oh, these, you know, they may not know what cortical areas are, but they can follow this idea that they're doing something. Um, you know, this, again, the audience would determine at what level of detail you'd go through. But this is the conceptual model. And if you keep this conceptual model in their heads, then that helps them understand the stuff that comes next. Okay. Um, so what I want to do now is break down a couple of the features of these slides, things that I personally feel are really important. Not everybody agrees with me, but let me just tell you what I think. So first of all, there is no reason anymore that I can see to use a four to three aspect ratio. That's the old style of like computer monitors and things. I would use always the 16 by nine aspect ratio for my slides because you get more real estate to put stuff on and all projectors work for this. I will add here, Zoom talks allow you to see a high resolution version of this on, your, on the person's screen who's watching. And that means you can get away with much smaller stuff than you can in a projector talk. Projectors are low contrast and low resolution, and you need to think about that when you're giving a normal talk, assuming we ever get back to normalcy. I'm optimistic, but we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, informative title. I think this is really important. What is the slide about? Remember that even if people are paying attention, sometimes they're gonna fuzz out for a moment. You want cues on the slide to bring them back to what it's about. So on every one of my slides, I have an informative title that says this is what this slide is about. Readable fonts. This is one of my pet peeves. I think you should never, under any circumstances, have less than a 16-point font anywhere on a slide in any universe. All right? Just, just don't do it. And I say that as a hard rule because then you don't have to worry about, oh, maybe I can get away with it now. Um, this is a small font, this is 16 point, this is too small. Now all of you can read this and all of you mostly that are watching this have young eyeballs, right? And young visual thalamuses and young visual cortices. Um, as your acuity fades and ironically your um, influence in the field rises, you are less able to distinguish things, right? Eyesight goes down, right? Hearing goes down. You wanna make it easier for the older folks you know, myself included, to follow what you're doing. So big fonts, I think, are utterly critical. And I mean this everywhere, in every figure caption, in every figure, on every figure axis, everywhere, nothing less than 16 point. Okay, animations to guide attention. This is something I feel very strongly about. So imagine I just put this whole thing up at first. Well, then, then I really have to guide your eye with my laser pointer. Instead, if I start with this, I can focus your attention on the stuff I'm talking about, which means that you have coherent visual and auditory processing. As soon as I put this other thing up, if you haven't processed this yet already, and you, what, you would ask, what would a person do if you just put this all up? They'd saccade all over the place, right? We know that from studies of people's visuals, you know, for visual uh, search behavior. You do not want them saccading over here while you're talking about this. So control their saccades. So control their saccades by only putting up the first bit and then it's no longer new. It doesn't mean, they doesn't have to grab their attention. They don't need to saccade to it very often. Go to the new stuff, they saccade to that, you talk about that. So again, visual and auditory information processing should be synchronized. Not too hard, but often something that people don't do. All right, so there we are, animations. All right, and you can see that. Um, 
Lines, again, should be thick enough to be seen on a projector, more than one point. Um, I strongly, for any important talk, I strongly encourage you, again, back in the room, back when things get back to something like normal, where it's not all, in, all uh, electronic or a video conference, to go to a room, put your talk up on the projector, and go to the very back of the room and ask, can I see everything easily? And if you can't, fix it. All right. And then this is another thing. This I also feel very strongly about. Everything on the slide should be explained. Don't put up stuff that you're not going to talk about. It's a waste of your um, sort of visual space on the slide. It's a waste of attentional space in your audience because they will try and figure out what it's about. All right? And so it's this thing that people often do is they just grab figures from papers and paste them up. And they said, oh, look here and look there. And then they ignore the other parts. Don't. Just don't do that if you want to be effective because it, again, it splits people's attention in a way that you don't want to split it. All right. Um, so I'll pause again. Any questions on this? I, I think we're good. Let's move okay, on. OK, great. Fantastic. Um, now, one thing that's lovely to do in talks is use videos. Um, there's a couple of things about using videos that I think are important. I'm just going to show you one example that the video I often use. So let me just talk to you the way I would explain this. Is, okay, so said, okay, so from the previous slide, and, and again, actually, I'm just going to go back here. At this slide, I say, okay, look, what, so what we've seen is that the hippocampus is an area that's critical for this borsalin memory encoding and retrieval process. And so now what we want to do, or what we do in my lab, is to try and understand how the hippocampus might support those functions. To do that, we use large-scale recordings of hippocampal neuron ensembles in awake-behaving animals. Let me show you what that looks like. All right, and the point of all of that, stepping out of the talk to the meta talk at the moment, is that I've explained what the slide is about. Now they know why I'm showing them this, right? And it fits with what they just had, so it's a story, right? So just think about that storytelling as you build your talk. All right, so here, what I'm showing you is the activity of 46 simultaneously recorded hippocampal neurons. Each tick here is the spiking of that neuron at a given time, and you'll see this scroll across. And at the same time, you see over here, this is the animal from a top-down camera, and this is a W-shaped track that you can just barely make out. And so you'll see in here the activity of these neurons. All right. Then, as you see, the animal runs, and you get what we in the place field community think is this quite beautiful pattern of spiking activity, where each neuron is active in a specific region of space. That neural activity continues for quite a while, and then something interesting happens. And then, in the real talk, I would talk more about what this event is and what it's for. Okay, but for here, I, I will spare you all that. Okay, a couple of points here. Don't play the video when you're talking about something else, right? It's even worse than having stuff on the slide that nobody is looking at because people's eyes are drawn to motion, right? Again, this is a very critical classical visual system thing. We look at stuff that's moving. If the stuff that's moving is not the same as the stuff that we're hearing about, it creates two information streams that we have to prioritize. It creates intentional bottlenecks. It, minim it reduces memory encoding. Don't do it. So. Wait and just set up the video as an animation. It's not hard to do so that it plays on a click. Narrate the video. Tell people what they're seeing. Again, visual and auditory information streams should be matched. Don't loop it, right? If you need to loop it, talk through the loops and then stop it, right? Again, it's not that hard to stop the video after two playbacks if you need to. But don't have it looping in the background while you do things because it's just plain distracting and annoying. Uh, right? And people will stare at that and they won't be listening to you. And presumably you have important things to say to them. Okay. So coming back to this on the introduction, your goal is broad, really broad context, why everyone in the room should care, what we know, and then the gap. And I haven't, didn't really talk about the gap yet. Um, in this case, what I might have done is say, okay, we know these, we see these patterns of activity are there. But what are they actually good for? And could these patterns of activity actually be the substrate for these memory retrieval events? Something like that. And that then leads us to these questions. OK, so there's a couple of ways to do the questions. So one is that event that I briefly showed you and didn't talk about is known as a sharp wave ripple, an SWR. And so 
this could you could lead in right from that and say, okay, given these events, get, think back to that model of hippocampal cortical information flow that I showed you before. Is it if these events are really a critical element of memories, we need to understand the nature of that information flow during these events. Um, and then we also want to understand what cells are being active and how does the content of those events reflect the nature of experience. Right now, this is really important, and this gets back to the, both the re repetition issues and the awake issues. These questions will come back throughout the talk. When you answer a question, you bring the slide back and you put the answer underneath the question. So that's the kind of repetition that I'm talking about, where you see the question, you see the answer, and then as you build it, you see the answer to the previous questions. That's actually quite natural. You're not, you, mean, you don't even need to repeat it. You're just giving them a visual cue, or you could say briefly, so we learned this, Okay, then we come back to it, we learn it again, and so on. So I'll talk more about this. This is one way to do it with questions that you answer. All right, again, these are specific questions that provide the structure for the rest of the talk. The nice thing is if you do this, the rest of your talk has two parts, right? One part related to this and one part related to this. So this is providing your audience and yourself with the scaffolding. The slide reappears and answers are filled in as the talk progresses. Okay. The other version is, okay, we saw that pattern of activity, that sharp wave ripple event. Now we can ask, does it have the properties we would expect for memory? And I'm just gonna list these. I'm not gonna, in the interest of time, not gonna explain them, but basically we want it to be time compressed, can represent not just the past, but the future, important for guiding behavior, coherent re representations. So this also then provides the structure for the rest of the talk. You have one section related to each of these bullet points mm -hmm. of where you're showing your data that always helps you know why the, tell the reader, tell the viewer why these data are important. And again, then the slide keeps reappearing. In this case, I would check off the boxes and maybe add some explanatory text under each one as it comes back. So by putting these slides up, they give you the marker points in your talk for where, we, where are we now? So the first time you see it, here's all four of them. Now let's focus on time compressed. Let's talk about that, all right? I hope that's clear. And so then the idea is then these questions provide that scaffolding, whether they're questions or things you fill in, and that has to be the structure of your talk. But the nice thing is once you get that right, then the rest of the talk, you kind of know what to fill in there. All right. Um, I, we're running light, so I'll, I'll skip there, but you know, Ali or whoever, please feel free to interrupt. Okay, so methods, results, and discussion. This is the part that goes inside between each of those questions to answer the question. All right, so for example, I might start with say, okay, let's focus on these first two bullet points. Activity, are these sharp wave ripple events? Do they represent something that's a time compressed recapitulation of a past or possible future experience? And are they even capable of representing these future possibilities, All right? So, Putting this up, that's what we're going to talk about next, telling people what we're doing. Well, now what I'm going to do is show you one talk, one slide from this and just go through it as an example. Well, it turns out, in fact, that they are both time compressed and they can represent their future paths. So let me show you what that looks like. So here is a top down view of an animal's actual location and trajectory. The location is here in yellow. The trajectory after this event is in green. The gray dots represent all the places the animal visited during this session on the track. So we record the activity of a number of place cells from this environment, E1, and we identify one of these sharp wave ripple events. We can divide it into 15 millisecond bins, each one here denoted by a specific color. And then we can decode that activity to ask the question, if the animal were moving through space, where would it be? Now it's not moving through space, it's quite stationary, but this is what its hippocampus is representing at those moments. And you see that it's a set of probability distributions, that's what we're graphing here. They evolve from dark blue to red as a function of distance to the center endpoint. So they actually start where the animal is here with this blue one, and then they progress in front of the animal to the center endpoint. And in fact, that's the decoded trajectory that is played out by this bit of activity. Okay. So the goal there is, again, showing one thing at a time and saying, OK, does this have the characteristics? And then I would say at the end of that, so let's look. So indeed, you see this is time compressed. This is a long trajectory that might take the animal many seconds being played out in about a fifth of a second. And this is indeed something this turns out to be what the animal should next do in this task. So this does indeed look like it's possible, something that could be related to a future path. All right. Um, also. 
really helpful. Tell, talk about other people's work, right? One of the things you should remember is some of these people might be in the audience. If you acknowledge them, you are creating a collegial environment where you're saying, hey, I'm doing this work, but I also know that you're doing this work. It makes them feel good. It doesn't detract from your talk. And it makes the world a better place because we probably acknowledge other people's contributions. So please do do that. Okay, so again, the features of this that I wanted to highlight, in addition to the important title, readable fonts, easy for people to see, animations to guide attention, and everything is fully explained. Again, that's the thing that actually people do wrong a lot, and I think it's really, really important. That way, everyone can follow it, no matter what their background is. Okay, and then others, you know, cite other relevant work. Okay, and then we could say, aha, so yes, we can go through and we can ask, are these events time compressed? Yes, they are. Are they capable of representing future possibilities? Yes, they are. So I've just repeated myself, but that's fine because I'm, cementing in these notions that this is like these sharp wave ripple events have the potential to be memory related activity. All right, and now we then go on to the next question. Are they important for guiding behavior, right? And so again, what we're trying to do is build up this structure of conceptual elements that are all linked together that we come back to multiple times through the talk so that we build up a story about what's going on. All right. Point here, check off the confirmed properties, turn the next property into a question. That's what we're trying to figure out. Is this true or not? Okay, so I'm gonna contrast that with what I see some people do in some talks, which is this. All right, they pop up a slide and it's a, clearly a cut figure from one of their papers. And it's, first of all, if you measured people's eyes, they would be doing this, right? All over the place with their, you know, saccade, saccade, saccade. What am I supposed to learn from this? Why am I? Why are you showing me two examples? Why are there these big letters? I don't need to know what that this is panel E. That's not important. Don't be lazy. Just get rid of the damn letters. So here are all the things that I think is wrong with this. There's no title. If I lose track, if I fuzz out for a moment and I'm not paying attention, I don't know what this slide is for. The letters are distracting. They're extra stuff. Science is hard. Science is really hard. The stuff that we all do is incredibly difficult to actually understand. Don't make it any harder by adding stuff that people don't need to see. The figures and fonts are really small. Now again, all of you can see this and it's fine. If I put this up on a real projector, it would not be easy to see but from the back of the room. No animations to guide attention. So people are looking all over the place, right? So, you know, this is that same thing I showed you, but this is the paper version. And I could go through it one thing at a time and try and get people's attention. But then they'd be looking down here. Well, wait, what's this other thing? And what's going on there? Um, also, I'll just add, why are they showing me A and B here, right? Why just C, D, and E? What are they hiding from me? It just, just don't do this, right? Make the story of the talk a separate thing. Okay, a couple of other points on these things. Um, again, hopefully this will work. It works really well on a trajectory and this is thanks to Kevin Bender. So is this easier to see or is that easier to see? Um, I'm hoping that this one is easier to see. Visual system turns out to depend on contrast. We know this. Keep that in mind. Black slides are fine. I can see the staining in the nucleus accumbens and all of this sort of cortical staining and so on in here a lot better when the background is black. Um, I did not, however, get rid of the letter, which people pointed out to me the first time I gave this talk. That was sloppy of me, my apologies. Okay, so summary on slide design, and I have some more points on this um, in the notes that I wrote up. Think when you're building a slide about what we know about building memories and visual system function. So descriptive title, so that there's always context that people can come back to even if they lose track for a moment. Minimize opportunities for stray saccades. Use high contrast backgrounds and projectors in particular are much lower contrast than the screens you're all currently looking at. So keep that in mind. Don't make it hard. It's already hard. Make the material the thing that people need to work at, not squinting to know what the figures are showing and explain everything that you show so people don't need to try and make it up. This is again, this is really hard to do, especially when you're hurried, but it really helps to just practice doing this slide by slide. Okay. So where are we? We've gone through introduction, and I will point out, I'm doing to you exactly what I say to do during a talk. 
these are this, this is the scaffolding for my current talk. We're going through these things and I have little things that pop up and this will, I think, help you remember this, right? That's the point. So clear, well-explained figures, what you found and what you learned. And then finally, the synthesis. So in the conclusion section, um, some set of bullet points that say, what have we learned? Well, we've learned you know, from some other talk, talk that I haven't given you. These events are important for memory. Their activity in prefrontal cortex has this particular structure, um, blah, 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 and so on, right? So this is, this is from a talk I gave many years ago, but this is basically the idea. So this would be something that would be a final answer to the questions that you posed at the beginning and would come up with there. And it can be fun to tell people what you're thinking. Right, so this makes us hypothesize that these awake mental replay events support memory retrieval and as well as using those memories to plan and to basically generate hypotheses about possible things that the animal or the brain could do next. And how are we gonna test those? Well, right now we're working on real-time content-based manipulations to understand how the specific spiking patterns in these events and what they represent interact with the animal's ability to make decisions about past experiences, right? There we are. Um, and recording and so on. Okay, so that's the basic idea. You don't have to end with this. It really depends on the talk, but it can be nice. Again, like the, the reason hopefully we do science is because it's fun and it's exciting and it's neat to think about ideas and neat to think about how things work. So letting people in on your thinking about that can be fun for them, right? They're like, oh, wow, that's a neat idea. I wonder how you do this, prompt questions and so on. Okay, so here we are, synthesis overarching conclusions and future directions. All right, so that's the talk elements. I will pause quickly. I guess we still have a little time because I wasn't told I had to shut up immediately at 11 our time. Um, any questions on this part? I mean, we can go on. Okay. I mean, we have a few questions to ask where I can save, I mean. Uh, yeah, I only have a couple more slides. So we'll, in that case, let's just save them and I'll finish up and then we okay. can just talk. Okay, before and after your talk, right? A talk is not something that just springs magically into being. Um, it is something that requires a lot of energy. You really need to prepare. And this is something I feel often is not taken seriously enough. Um, you need to go, you need to give your talk multiple times before you give it if you want it to go well. You have to practice. Um, I have done this for many years. When I give a new talk, I practice it. I go through it all. I make sure I know what I want to say. Again, I don't tend to write things out because I think that takes too long and it makes it sort of non-spontaneous and I don't like reading it, but I practice it. Um, I work hard to get rid of filler words like um. Now, I, I say all right or right too much. Some of you may have noticed. I work really hard not to, so you can only imagine how much I would say it if I didn't. But it really helps to focus on smooth speech where you're not adding extra filler words. It just makes it more pleasant to listen to and practice. So um, there was a particular talk I gave in 2015. It was a 15 minute talk and I practiced it at least 20 or 30 times. Um, probably more like 40 or 50 now that I think about it because I wanted it to be as good as I could make it, right? It's the sort of thing where it really matters. If you have your talk down, you know, one way to think about this uh, is you want your talk to live in let's just say conceptually basal ganglia circuits. You don't want to have to be thinking in great detail all the time about what you're saying. You do want to be, of course, paying attention to what you're saying, but the more automated it is, the more you can just let it flow, the more you can, for example, look at your audience, the more you can process whether they're paying attention to you. Again, totally impossible in this context, so I have no idea other than hearing the occasional questions whether anyone is listening, but I assume you are. Um, but normally it's really useful to look out at your audience. It's incredibly important to make eye contact with them, ideally as much as possible during the talk because we're primates and it really helps to know that we're looking at each other and engaged with each other. So really do practice, particularly for important talks. And if you have friends who you feel like can give you useful feedback, that's wonderful. Um, it's hard to get honest feedback. We, none of us want to hurt each other's feelings and it's a difficult thing, but you know, like in my lab, people often give a talk to our lab meeting and we take it apart in a productive, hopefully constructive criticism way. And you know, don't do this, that, uh, that didn't make sense. And it makes the talks better. 
So if you're in an environment where you have supportive colleagues, please take advantage of them to get feedback. It's very difficult to know what of the things that you understand are easily understood by an audience and which ones aren't. So getting that feedback can be really critical there. Okay, right before the talk, make sure you get there early enough, this is sort of obvious. Check the lights and sound levels. Be a little bit obsessive about the fact that, hey, are people gonna be able to see you? Are people able to hear you? Because not every place is set up properly, so you're allowed to be a little obsessive about that. Not obnoxious, ideally, but a little obsessive. And afterwards, it's perfectly reasonable in some contexts, not all, to get feedback and ask about areas for improvement. So for example, I gave a talk at Woods Hole and a friend of mine was in the audience. This was for a course there. And he came up to me afterwards and said, you know, Lauren, I really just didn't get that section. That was so valuable to me because that tells me, so it's a little painful, right? It's, it's a small amount of ego bashing. It means I screwed up. It means I didn't do as good a job as I wish I had, but it tells me where to improve things. So, you know, asking people, hey, did this make sense? Do you have an idea of how I could do this better? You know, this is really hard, right? It seems scary. It's sort of laying yourself out there. And if the people are mean, uh, as some people are, then it's a bad idea. So I'm never in favor of just doing this blindly. There are some institutions where I would never do this. But if you're among friends or if you have some friends and you know them or, you know, you have a senior person in the audience who you respect and you think is not a horrible human being, getting that feedback can be really valuable. Okay, that's it. So that's everything I had to say. Um, I'm happy to, I will stop sharing my screen now so that I can at least see people a little bit, or at least I will try to stop sharing. Okay, so um, if there are questions, I'm happy to hear them. Uh, I'm also happy to have people argue with me. If you feel like things I said were wrong, please let me know, because again, feedback is useful. Uh, so uh, should I look at things? Yeah, you can. I mean, I can try to summarize. There are like two or three questions on stylish design, right? That I can summarize. I mean, and basic idea is that dark themes or like more white background. Which one do you have a preference? Or yeah, that's suggest? a really good point. So, um, so the I tend to do white background just because our plots come out on a white background, and so having black to white to black. Like those high contrast edges, I think are not optimal. But if you have sections or antibody stains, fluorescent microscopy and so on and so forth, then I would absolutely go to a black background. And you know, real professionals actually do things or well, not professionals, but like I've, I've gotten some feedback from uh, people who help folks do TED talks where they say, you know what? And you can make the subtle, you can make the different sections of your talk have a subtly different background color. And that also provides like a visual organization for them so they know it's one section. Now, I've never gotten to the point of doing that. But yeah, again, you can think of things like that. But I, I prefer black on white because usually you're doing this in a relatively dark room. And so the white kind of helps give a little bit more luminance to, again, help people keep awake. And it's easier with figures because building all of your figures in inverted color is kind of a pain unless you write a whole bunch of Python or MATLAB or Julia or whatever your, whatever your medium is code to do that. All right, anything else? All right, I see various things. There was a one, was there a question? Sorry, I'm not sure what I should do. I have one was a, is that right, Kazra? I'm not yeah, sure quite how to do this. Um, from Chris Rogers. And it says, sure. in pedagogy, there's, in pedagogy, sorry, there's a broad agreement that active learning strategies are better than lecture format, but this hasn't really caught on in scientific lectures. Do you think these are fundamentally different scenarios or should we consider employing some kind of active learning strategies? Yeah, that's a really wonderful question. So I think the, the challenge there, uh, so and absolutely right, the more engaged your audience is, the more they're thinking along with you, the more likely it is that they will remember stuff, right? And I think that's a rough way to summarize why the active learning is useful. The question is, how do you do that in a talk where you need to impart certain information? And honestly, not everyone is going to understand. 
So if you have things, right, be like, and this is the problem, you know, it's it's not necessarily a bell curve, but let's pretend it's a bell curve of comprehension or background or something. And that means that people on one end of the curve are likely to be a little bit bored and people on the other end of the curve are likely to be a little bit lost. And you can only do so much to prevent that, right? You want to pull everyone into the comprehension zone as much as you can, but it can be really difficult to do that with everyone. So to the extent that you can get them engaged and thinking about things, um, the way I tend to think of that is by encouraging questions. So I usually with my talk say, hey, please, any questions you have, just ask them. I don't care if I get through it all. I'd rather communicate. That's as close as I know how to come to the active learning thing. You can do demos if your work allows for that. Like if your work is on some phenomenon where different people might have, um, you know, they might have an opinion or they have some idea or something like that. You know, you can ask people to raise hands and things like that. I'm not sure how to do it, uh, but if you figure out a way, please let everyone know. Okay, sorry. Uh, oh, great question. You go ahead. Or do you want to go on? To do it. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I screwed up. I forgot to unmute myself. I think I was talking in the ether for a bit. So uh, another question from Anna that's upvoted. For a job talk, how to show that we have done a lot without being overwhelming? Yeah. So, so this is, again, where feedback is really useful. So the one thing about a talk is you're not presenting every analysis that you've done. Your goal is not to show, is not, it's not a paper. Right? You're not going to go through every figure and every control. What you're going to do is basically ask people to believe you and then say, look, I did this. So if you start with you know, one slide per minute, then that limits pretty seriously what you can do anyway. And you, you know, really, again, the, like in a job talk, people want you to have that high level conceptual stuff. They want it to make clear that you've thought about it, but they do not expect you to present every control analysis. You can present like some example control, like if it, again, it depends on your field, but you might present, okay, so we controlled for a number of things. I'm just gonna show you one of those analyses. And people will be okay with that and they can always ask you about it. And of course, if you really know your work, then you'll have no trouble saying, oh yeah, we did this other control as well. This is how it comes out. Or you can have that as a secondary slide. But mostly what I would say is, you know, you. That's where practice, right? Particularly for a job talk. If you can give a talk to friends or like faculty who are not your PI, so who are less, ideally who are less um, you know, knowledgeable about your work and ask them, Does that makes sense. Did that seem about right? Uh, that's, that's sort of, that's what I think, those are the things that you can do to really try and you know, strike that balance. But it, it's always hard and you're always going to lose some people and you might always bore people a little bit. So, you know, you also just have to have reasonable expectations. Okay, thank you. Another question from John Bladen uh, saying, this might be a Sharpie Ribble specific question, but videos are so helpful in talks. What thought process do you use when constructing and organizing your videos? Yeah, so I guess I try, I, videos are fantastic because, right, we are very visual and movement oriented creatures. You know, we probably goes back to days on the savannah hunting our prey and so on and so forth or interacting in our family groups, all of these things. So they're really effective at, at being memorable, um, which is wonderful, but they're also require a lot of attention. So the way I tend to think about them is if it's, if I have something again to go along with it, where it's making a critical point, then I use a video or, you know, and again, also the animations of course are a form of stop action video in that sense. So I guess from that perspective, it's always using them. Um, but they can also get really overwhelming and they can seem sort of over the top. So I would tend, I tend not to use a large number of them unless it's necessary to understand the data. So having lots of things sort of sweep across the screen, I guess what I would say is I would only use videos for things that cannot be conveyed well without a video. And if it is a video, then spend the time to really explain it um, and make it clear why you're showing them this video. Why is this critical? Because again, remember videos are only gonna be examples. So you never, you can't prove anything with a video. Um, so, so they might, step in for the example, but they cannot step in for the quantification of the sort of data set level effects. So I guess I would sort of think of it that way. Thank you. Another question from Castro Vaziri and asking, uh, I mean, what do you suggest to do? Do we need an ending with a thank you slide? Would you end with an acknowledgement or yes. like a question mark? 
I apologize, sorry. So in this case, um, I can acknowledge my lab and I didn't do that just because they, 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 they were not the direct contrib contributors. And thank you, I really, I apologize for forgetting that. It is really important to recognize none of us are do our work in a vacuum. Um, and you can do that acknowledgement up front. You can, you can say on your second slide before I start, you know, as a postdoc, I really want to just thank the people in my lab, particularly such and such for, for this work, this work I did with someone, or you can do it at the very end, but it is really important to do that. Um, again, it's just, it's a feeling thing, right? It's an acknowledge, it's saying other people contributed to this, those people appreciate it. You, we appreciate it when we're acknowledged, right? It's just, it's nice. It's a statement that we're in this together and we're sort of working towards something together. So very important to add. And I'm sorry, I left that out. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I, I know you've been very generous with your time, but I don't want to hold you here. Can we have like two or three more questions? Uh, yeah, no, I'm fine. I, I did not schedule anything until 1 p.m. because I was not sure how long this was going to go. Um, 1 p.m. my time Pacific. So I'm good. So let them fly. All right, so this actually comes from me. Um, how do you handle like argumentative um, questions at the end? This might actually be very like politically sensitive if it's a job talk or like every talk is a job talk. I don't know. I mean, how, yeah. how would you handle that? Yeah, so it's tough. So I think um, in general, so there's a couple of points. One is, are you understanding the question? And this is really hard, right? Understanding, as, as you all know, um, if you've been in a relationship with any other human being, you will know that you don't always understand each other, right? Um, and that even if you've been together uh, for a long time, you sometimes don't understand each other properly. So first thing is make sure you understand the question, right? So if someone is saying, hey, that doesn't make sense, and they say, what about this? And it's not quite clear what you're saying, first clarify. Right, say, look, what I hear you asking about is this, is that right, right? And so what, what you're doing there is you're acknowledging your, their question and you're trying to make sure that you're getting it right. So you're showing them respect for this and saying, look, I really wanna get this, I wanna answer your question correctly, so may, let, me, let me make sure I got it. Okay, once you get what the question is, that can take a little time, but once you get it, you do your best to answer it, right? And in that case, you can say, it's fine to say, you know, that's a great point. We don't know, but here's what we're thinking, right? And that's great because that means there's more to do. Now, if it's a question about your fundamental conclusion and then you say, oh, we don't know, that's not such a good idea, right? So like you really need to believe what you're saying in the first place, obviously, but if it's something not central, don't fight it, right? This is, you know, Aikido more than Taekwondo for the people who appreciate that sort of uh, metaphor. Just like you can go with it and say, yeah, that's a great question. That's really interesting. Here's what we've done. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. That's great. If they're saying, you know, I just don't buy this. And you say, okay, that makes sense. Could we talk about this offline? Right? Can we talk about this afterwards? Um, don't, you know, don't tell them they're wrong. You can say, or you can say, well, you know, I don't agree, but perhaps I'm not fully in understanding. Can we talk about this later? Or can we talk about this after the talk? Um, and usually the moderator of the talk would step in or something at that point anyway. So it's just a matter of always showing the people you're talking to respect because they deserve it until they demonstrate that they don't. Um, and uh, trying to understand it as best as possible. And then if you just like, if they're just missing what you're saying and saying, you know, I, I feel like I may not be explaining this well, but let's let's find some time to talk about this later. Thank you. One more question from Monica about actually these days in Zoom talks. Asking, you mentioned eye contact to engage with the audience, but you suggest now that we are all giving online talks. And sometimes it's hard not to sound mechanic and or how to adapt the flow of the talk without being able to perceive how the audience is responding. Um, I share your pain is all I can say to that. <laughs> I find this so difficult. Um, I mean, again, I've practiced giving talks for the last many, many years. So it's easier for me, I think, perhaps to just talk because I have lots of, you know, low level circuits that I can engage <laughs> that maybe require less attention. But I really find it difficult not to see my audience, not to know if what I'm saying makes sense to them. Um, and so, you know, that's like, I guess I totally agree. What I would say then is it may even be more important to stop and say, okay, did that make sense? Or does anyone have any questions to really prompt people to engage with you and to come back come back at you with things that are not making sense and to, to lower the energy barrier for doing so. But beyond that, I don't know what the solution is other than you know wish the people working on a vaccine and the clinical trials as much well as we possibly can. 
No, thank you. Going back to the ending slide question, Laura is asking, a hey, thank you for the great talk, and he's asking that um, what's one thing uh, they've seen is that sometimes people put a summary slide in the end that can be used in the Q&A. What do you think about this approach that you can then oh, refer yeah. to back to that rather than have the acknowledgement? Of? Yes, you know, no, and I think that's a great point. Or you can go to, so you need the acknowledgement somewhere. Um, typically they're put at the end. Um, what I would usually do after the acknowledgements is I would flip back a slide to my last summary slide or something like that. Um, or you could just obviously put it again after the acknowledgements. It is very useful to have your slides up for answering questions because then you can go to things that either you included in the talk or things that you thought people might ask about and that you've included after the talk. Uh, but but I, I completely agree that having the summary up there is a really nice way to sort of prompt questions or to get people, again, as another continual reminder of what you talked about and things that might prompt them to ask. Another question from uh, Sarah Starosta, she's asking, you mentioned to talk about how to tell well one did. Did I miss it? So I think it's uh, Sorry, what was the question, Ali? I missed that. So, I mean, how would you tell someone, I think if I understand this correctly, how to tell how well one did? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so tough. So, um, so you sometimes you get a feeling like so some it it really depends and so I don't I don't want to say anything really determinative here because you know it might be that you're the last talk at a conference and everyone is exhausted and you do the best possible job but there's still no questions and no one comes up to you afterwards because everyone is tired right that is not your fault that's just because you got stuck into the conference so so what I want to say is the things that I use which on average are indicative are how many questions are there, right? So the more questions there are typically, the more I think you've engaged the audience. Again, there are cases where that doesn't happen. There might be institutions where people are afraid to ask questions because they are often you know, told that they're stupid or something like that if they ask questions. I hope that's less true these days, but it might still happen in places. So you need to be aware of that. Um, you know, you can listen to what people say, like, do they say great talk? But that's that's very low reliability information because people are trying to be nice to each other typically. Um, I guess what I would say is if you're, you know, if you're meeting with people and they sort of said, wow, that was really interesting, it made me think this, that's a good sign. Um, if you're meeting with people and they don't clue into what you're doing and it doesn't go anywhere, then either they're very self-centered, which is very possible because, hey, some of us are in this world, or they that you just didn't make enough of an impression on them or didn't convince them what you're doing was that important. Um, but it's tough. And so the best you can do is just integrate over multiple talks to, and, and see, you know, do people come up and talk with you afterwards? Um, and if, if it's uh, the first thing, you know, if it's a it's a case where there's lots of people and then everyone just leaves. You probably haven't done a great job, but if some people come up and say, wow, that was neat or wait, what about this? That's a good sign. Okay, thank you. Last two questions. Priscilla is again asking, so what if in the middle of your talk, five, 10 minutes in, you realize that you have very low engagement? Uh, what do you do to pivot out of this? <laughs> okay, so uh, that's tough. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just have to just keep going, right? Like, you know, you cannot control your audience. You don't know where you are. It's just hard. So the best thing I can say for that is to say that, you know, what, what you want to do if you see that happening more than once is you want to rethink your intro, right? You want to just say, okay, why I am not reaching these people. I am not telling them something that they seem to care enough about why. So, you know, pro that may mean you're starting too specific. That may mean that you're not making your questions sufficiently compelling. Um, it's hard to say. I think, you know, uh, yeah, beyond that, I guess, it, yeah, it's difficult for me to say, you, you, you know, you can imagine it could be that you're not, also, you know, it's a question of how dynamic you are as a person. Right. So people who are very engaging and positive or, you know, who are like have strong making strong and interesting statements. So if you're if you don't feel as comfortable making those statements, maybe you need to go out there 
and say, you know, just say things that are a little bit more extreme, like this fundamentally changed my life. Let me tell you why, right? Just that sort of thing. And if, you know, if that doesn't work, then it's hopeless because they're all half dead anyway. So there's nothing you can do. All right, thank you. And one last perhaps question from Amir is that in a science talk, does body language add value to your presentation or is it something that you need in management, business, and entertainment industry? No, it, it does. It makes a big difference. So for example, um, in my, there, there are some talks where you have to stand behind a podium because that's where the, um, that's where the laptop is. There's no remote and that's where the microphone is. I hate that personally. So I like to walk around, I like to move. And if you know, if you look at like TED Talks, things that are sort of more professionally produced, they never have people standing in one place. They always have motion. And, and again, we're, we're evolved monkeys, right? So, you know, um, the, uh, monkeys are also evolved monkeys, of course, but we evolved in a different direction. Um, so, so it's just seeing that like, the movement, the engagement, the sort of gestures, it really matters in terms of, hey, is this person excited about what they're doing? Are they, are they showing me stuff? Um, I will say on that note, you know, having a good presentation remote, bringing your own remote, right? Never depending on anyone for a laser pointer, but making sure you have your own. And so I like to walk around and I like to be able to, you know, zoom in on things or look at stuff. And so I have a fairly nice Logitech presentation remote, which, you know, lets me do all of that. And I prefer that um, because it, it means that I can, I'm not tied down and I can move around. So I, I strongly, you know, I guess I, I would put this more broadly in science, I feel like we often ignore the things that say our more business or other colleagues have figured out about like, how do you manage people? How do you budget? How do you give presentations? <laughs> and, and that's not because we're just so good at it naturally. It's because people just assume that, yeah, hey, you're smart, so you'll figure it out, right? And I think that's kind of a travesty because we know a lot about managing people and building effective teams and giving good presentations. And it's sort of like a scientist that information is just not shoved into our heads because we're too busy doing other stuff. All right. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I mean, if I mean, am I allowed? Let me ask my bosses here, Lindsay and others. Are we allowed to conclude the session? I mean, I, I don't see any more questions or if like other co-hosts, like those, do you have questions? All right. Well, I mean, thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren, for this. It was my great. pleasure. I've been to a previous version of this talk and yet I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it was well, a repetition of some sorts. Yeah, there you are. Repetition matters. All right. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I thank appreciate you, the opportunity. Uh, yeah, this was helpful. Yep. Hopefully, we'll see the rest of the folks uh, at our one day VIDA symposium, The Future of Dopamine. Join us to see the future of dopamine, all the 18 wonderful features of dopamine. Thank you. Thank you. And yep. Bye. We will end the broadcast. This is the end.